The planet's puppet masters almost surely have a plan This clearly may be something there beyond the realm of man And until you thoroughly tested every last close just That's true, Dr. Sayers. Very well. Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show, Greg Carwood Company. All right, higher side chatters. I think many of us can agree we have watched the disease that is private fractional reserve banking and the profit or bust mindset slowly erode or infect nearly all aspects of reality. From the exhausted environment to the march of the military industrial complex to the lives spent in unfulfilling jobs just to pay off the debt that got them there, our societal and personal motivations are so warped by this green monopoly money that people regularly debate what behaviors even reflect true human nature versus the crack-like addiction we have to this hamster wheel cycle of greed, debt, and consumerism. It's a lot to unpack, and many of us recognize this destructive and sociopathic system cannot continue forever. But before much can be done, we need the communal equivalent of a full medical evaluation, diagnosis, and treatment plan. And lucky for us, one of my favorite physicians of finance and doctors of the debt-based system of rule is here to drop some knowledge. His name is John McMurtry. He's a retired professor of philosophy, expert in value theory, and author of several books, including The Cancer Stage of Capitalism. You've seen him in Zeitgeist moving forward, and now on the day before Election Day, it is an honor and a pleasure to have him here. John, welcome to the higher side. My pleasure too, Greg. Yeah, man. Thanks for doing this. I'm absolutely psyched to be able to talk to you about some of this stuff. Well, I just wanted to say, Greg, (laughs) I wanted to applaud your introduction. (laughs) You've compelled a lot into, you know, a a few moments of exposition and what, you know, we can develop, develop at many spots. One of the spots that uh, fractional reserve, for example, is very much part of the cancer system. The cancer system just, you know, maybe we get the physician's diagnosis here. The cancer system is the disease, and it's the disease of transnational money sequences without inhibition, over kind of uh, expanding everywhere, uh, overrunning all life needs and so on. And that's behind everything that's going on, from the wars to, you know, the, the loss of infrastructure to everything you you identified. Now, fractional reserve banking is certainly a key part of it. It's the sort of, you might say, the original disorder. But it's been around really through modernity. What we've seen since 2008, 2007 and 8, is the handing out of the banks. Without, you know, fractional reserve isn't enough. They've spent it all and lost it all, and they're speculating on. And so the governments, with the U.S. leading, have given trillion after trillion. And in the case of the U.S., it was over 17 trillion by uh, two years ago. And Bernie Sanders was the one who insisted on exposing this through his ability to do so from the Senate. Now that trillions and trillions, it adds up to more than the whole gross national product. And that has just been given to the banks with no fractional reserve. This was to recapitalize them. So the cancer system has gotten worse and worse. Fractional reserve is just the original drive wheel. But now it's just giving the money straight out from the public sector, which is meanwhile deprived and dispossessed, like people who benefited from the public sector, what I call the civil commons, that make their lives safe and secure. It's taken all that. They've raided all the public sector options and capacities like infrastructures to be able to really sustain the people because the only thing that matters is transnational money sequences and bribing them as well through corporations, not just through the trillions to the banks, but most of the public expenditures today are really being picked up by, for example, the whole so-called green technology. That's all really money flowing from the public sector into uh, the corporations, transnational corporations' pockets for huge guaranteed profits and ineffective solutions. So in short, I would respond yes, yes, yes to what you say, 
But don't think it just depends on the fractional reserve system. Yes, it does. But there's a lot worse happening here that indicate the carcinogenic nature of this whole system at the social level of life organization, which I can explain if you'd like me to just go on with why I use the model of a cancer to diagnose the disease that you started with, with your lovely introduction. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are terms that a lot of people probably aren't used to hearing equated to uh, economics, but you do a great job. I think, yeah, definitely elaborate on that for us. Well, if we just look at the cancer model itself, and then I'll go into the money sequences, how it works at the social level of organization. But I was driven to the cancer model of diagnosis by originally doing an article, which was medically refereed back in 1995. And I really wanted to understand what was happening here, but through the lens of what I think is the most effective form of analysis that we have, which is medical diagnosis. Well, medical diagnosis doesn't work beyond what philosophers call the agent relative level or beyond the individual level, the atomic level. They just look at the body, the individual body itself and what are its problems, including with cancer. It'll be a cancer of the life host, the individual life host, not the social life host. They just can't get there through their methods, although there's, there are movements definitely in that direction since 1995 to understand the social disorder as a disease, which is afflicting at the social level of life organization, but has much the same characteristics to distinguish it. So that with a cancer, for example, and why I was driven to the cancer model, also had, like most people do have, cancer in the family, cancer myself, my wife died from cancer. So it was a model that was very clear to me as a possibility. And then the more I investigated it, just more and more the evidence. You always look, if you're scientific, you always look for disconfirming evidence as well as confirming evidence. But you really want to look for disconfirming evidence as much as you can to ensure that your diagnosis is correct. And you're always open to more disconfirming evidence that you have to meet. So that's the way I was going. I didn't want to believe this. I was driven to it by the phenomena. So what what you know is happening with an individual level of cancer and what I'm saying is just like the law uh, laws of physics or even the laws of biology apply far beyond the individual level to the social and the evolutionary level as a whole. So with cancer itself, it begins with, and it's, you know, one recognizes that by first of all, there's, a, there's something going at the cellular level. In the technical sense, tumors are created by cells that have lost the ability to assemble and create tissues of normal form and function. That's a technical definition of what's going on. Mm-hmm. But the key to that is that, first of all, it's an uncontrolled and unregulated reproduction and multiplication, self-multiplication inside a life host. And the key thing is that it has no committed life function to the life host. That's really the essence of a cancer. It's not only uncontrolled and unregulated reproduction and multiplication like, say, a virus is, but it has no commitment to the life host and it only multiplies to the point of the death of the life host, which is now society. So that's a key feature and it's also recognized by our features is by it's aggressive and it's opportunistic and it appropriates all the nutrients and resources from its host in order to multiply itself further. And here you really start to say, well, that's just what's going on with these transnational private money sequences that have no life function, that multiply their agencies within the body with absolutely no committed life function. And the key, though, in terms of the body's immune system defense, and it also applies at the social level, is that it's not recognized by the immune system. It's not effectively recognized by the immune system. That's the whole key to fighting cancer is you have to recognize it first. And really the whole evolution of society is dealing with disorders that are multiplying through the body in some way or or in the body so as to give it, as to disorder it, disease it. And usually we recognize that the immune system is a miracle of evolution. I mean, it, it, and I can mm-hmm. go into the de- definite description at the level of the individual life host, the organism. But in both cases, the response to all possible diseases has already been evolved 
inside our immune system and it's you know the t-cells the killer cells the t-cells comes from the thymus gland that's in any way it's a really a marvelous beautiful process of recognizing and then isolating and, and attacking and erasing this killer enemy but the problem with the killer enemy is and this is really differentiates it from a virus that it is that it metastasizes across the host it jumps across the host it doesn't just spread by an enlarging circle somehow it jumps right across the host from one place to the other and in fact it can start at the sexual organs and end up as brain cancer or many, many other possible combinations. But it metastasizes, which is a really scary thing. It means that your, the, your whole immune system is not working because it's gone by the filters that normally pick these things out and uh, that, that normally fight back and reestablish the uh, health of, of the host. It metastasizes, and it metastasizes every which way. It can metastasize across, seemingly action at a distance, leaping across the body from one part to another. That really distinguishes it. And that's exactly what we see with transnational money sequences. It really begins at that level where it metastasizes. It just jumps from one realm and one domain and one society to the other. You know, how does it do this? Well, in fact, it does this through the so-called trade treaties, which are essentially to protect and increase the transnational money sequences against all social life defenses. Mm -hmm. That's the essence and the defining feature of the social level of uh, cancer spread and and disaster everywhere, because that's it just keeps on going. It just never stops. You know, they, they, these things have all failed, and that's the wonder of Trump, really, is that he has brought the dispossession phenomena that is going on. That He doesn't call it a cancer. More and more people are. But he's at least drawing attention to what the mass media, the corporate media, always repress and will never report. He's drawing attention to that, that the whole society, the whole working society has been dispossessed and then belittled and then left to fend for themselves in a system that actually will kill them one way or another and, and disease them on the way. And that is happening. So it progressively infiltrates and invades, but also by metastasis, which is a, a distinguishing characteristic, and nothing is allowed to limit it. When the cancer is functioning well, nothing's allowed to eliminate. And that's why these trade treaties, they go right into your constitution. They become an obligation of the constitution. So the cancer system has gone into the constitution itself through trade, so-called trade treaties, essentially protection of transnational money sequences behaving in a cancerous way. Nothing stops them. Mm -hmm. They'll just get rid of it. And I, I can spend the rest of the program identifying all the places in which that's true and all the ways in which it's true. And then this just goes on and on. And we get more and more breakdowns of the life function of not only the individual body, but the social level of life organization where the laws of biology apply as well. It affects the host, and the host is not even now. I mean, I, I I keep track of when people recognize it, and there are there are a number of recognitions of it, but it's usually screened out, selected out of anything. And for for example, in, in my interviews with newspapers, they will always eliminate any reference to that when they publish the interview. It's just mm -hmm. you can count on they're doing it. So when I said, for example. The global capitalist experiment has failed in Russia. This was, you know, earlier on, back in the 90s. I said to, to interviewers, you know, I just, I really want to insist that you do, quote, now you can do what you want with it, but I do want the idea to be communicated. Mm -hmm. And then the journalist, who would be a journalist that I trusted, would so agree, and then it wouldn't come up. And then what happens at the editorial level, and it tells you about how the cancer system works by lowering the social immune system from recognition of what is wrong. They just wouldn't let it in. They won't let it in. I've done a lot of work for the mass media, and one of them is by letters, which I've published probably thousands of them. Innumerable letters have been published and headlined and so forth in the, in the media. 
And one medium I more or less trusted was the Guardian Weekly, which is both the only newspaper with ads in it that I look at. Although in the New York Times Weekly, I've uh, picked up on two. So you, you start to see how the disorder is functioning. That's why I do it. Well, I reported to them, and just quoting uh, international law, that the invasion that everybody was saying was a sure thing going to happen in Iraq. I identified it uh, as, in very, you know, clipped journalistic terms that were documented, that this was the supreme crime of international law, war of aggression, and cited the the charter from Nuremberg, as well as the right inside our criminal code. We have that. So they just wouldn't publish it. And I tried it from different authors, you know, get another person with another name, another place to send in the same thing, because I, I knew what was going to happen, which is what did happen. There was going to be what this system specializes in, an eco-genocide. And that indeed is what has happened in Iraq ever since, right, starting from 1991. But, you know, they, they used to do it under the pretense of sanctions, uh, embargoes. But it was the same thing, just bombing their infrastructure to smithereens so that 500,000 children died from it. And when the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, who was Madeleine Albright, right. who's the hero of Hillary Clinton, that's, you know, they're like uh, joined at the hip. She was, you know, this was brought to her attention that it was started with the Harvard Medical School identifying the deaths of 500,000 children. And she said, yes, it is a large price to pay, but we think it is worth it. Hmm. So there's no limit. There is no limit to what they'll do, Right. what the system will do. And there's a kind of a positional determinism within it, even if that person was okay when they went in, as I thought the Clintons might be to begin with. They get determined by the position that they're within. And the position that they're within is now a cancer system, a global cancer system. Mm -hmm. And they're all, all the resistance that we see going on around the world can be really interpreted as a social immune reaction to what's happening. But of course, it's not reported in the facts. It's not reported in the responses. It's always, and here becomes the, the, the uh, primary, the, the cornerstone of U.S. ideology, imperial ideology, is the blaming of the enemy. The enemy, the enemy, and it can be anyone at all. It can be your local worker, community organizer, as it was through Central America in the 80s with presidential support and 90s. They just had death squads and so forth, and it just it just continued because they were communists, and that used to be the great enemy term. Once you called someone a communist, as I did on an interview with a death squad officer who had reformed, and there was a you know, it was a world summit in Toronto, and there was a counter summit. Anyway, I was the chair of jurors, and I asked this former death squad officer, and he said, just to give you a sense of how deep this. Identify as an enemy, that the, as an automatic enemy of the listening audience, and they'll just go like a Pavlovian dog in their salivations and carrying on with their destructive activities. It's okay. Hmm. He said, well, they would, they, people at the top would identify someone as a communist or a Marxist, and normally we would eliminate that person or hmm. person. It was just built in built into the police apparatus and army apparatus as well as the extra military forces that are very much at work now. ISIS itself, you know, is, begins as a U.S. organized, you know, begins with uh, in, in Afghanistan to take down the Soviet Union. And of course, the Soviet Union was the enemy. You can just, you just call it that, call it the enemy and anything is justifiable from now on. Right. And that's where there wasn't any such thing really as, as this jihadism. It didn't exist. I traveled through the Middle East and as a younger man. I've traveled through all the countries of the Middle East. And at that time, there was no such thing. There were jihadi type mentalities, but it wasn't an organized force. That we can thank the United States for, and specifically Brzezinski. So... We have this system calling anything that resists the enemy, and that's the cornerstone operation of the global ideology and the disease it is carrying. Mm. 
<laughs> Man, you covered quite a bit right there. And I yeah. do I do love your breakdowns. And I think cancer is a, a very appropriate analogy. One quote that I really like from you that I think is important for people to remember on a personal level, I think it gets into some of that, is you say the most suppressed issue of our epoch is the war between life capital on one hand and money capital on the other. Can you elaborate on that dichotomy and how to separate the two? Well, in a, in a way, you've seen, I've talked about the way the money capital system operates when it has achieved, it come to its cancer stage. Everything I've said in the last minutes has been really describing the phenomena of the money sequence. But the question goes deeper than that. It's really, you know, you might say, well, uh, yeah, I, I get the phenomena. I get what you're identifying. I get why it's cancer. But exactly what's going on at the inner core, the drive wheel of this whole system. And this is, as a philosopher, I'm also a logician, and I've worked it out as, as a logical sequence in work that actually is not publishing and I'm doing right now. And I'll just, what I have published and what uh, you, you will see in the book too, is the concept of rationality itself comes into a play inside philosophy. Really, it, start, it starts with modernity itself and David Hume. I won't go in and John Locke. I won't go into that source of it. But what the key of it is, and it still runs the understanding of, say, Harvard universities, various scientific and philosophical forms of what's going on. Rationality is self-maximizing choice or preference. That's what it is. So it begins right at the level where everybody says, well, that's the way evolution runs. That's what we all are. We're all naturally selfish. We have many, many expressions of it. Human, human nature is naturally greedy. And on and on, we hear many, many expressions of it. But the underlying formula, which actually governs all American social science is and, and all that it influences elsewhere, which is considerable, you know, it, it it gets control of even the higher research grants, as it has now, and it's just gotten much worse. In any case, rationality means, by presupposition, if you're rational, if you follow reason, then it's a self-maximizing preference you sequence in everything you have a choice in. It's only self-maximizing choice. Well, that seems innocent enough in itself. But the self-maximizing choice, you see, it's only rational if you're consistently self-maximizing. So if you do anything on anyone else's behalf, say in the economy, which is the, you know, the basic system at work here, the so-called economy, it's not economic at all, it's the opposite. But the so-called economy, everybody, every agent in the economy is presupposed by the pseudo-subject of economics to be self-maximizing in their choice, and all their models are based on that being the case. And all the way, not just, you know, the, the key is the sequencing. It, it just keeps on going. It keeps on going. Well, so far, we don't have a disease in the social body, but it, it slowly turns in, you know, becomes, well, what that equals is basically an equation that always more money value for the self, whether the self is a transnational corporation or even a, a consumer and worker, the self always maximizes. He always wants more. Economic man always wants, so-called economic man always wants more. And he always wants more in money terms. So that's a huge transition that takes evolution, historical evolution of a whole culture, a dominant culture, an imperial culture for 300 years or more. But because it's the sequencing, the, the always more money value for the self, meaning, you know, anything that's so self-maximizing, including the corporation or indeed this corporations together, is good. So that's good. And if you're not doing that, it's bad. Moreover, it's not efficient. It's not productive. So efficiency and productivity always mean people think, oh, it means that things are going to come to us with less cost. Well, yes, less money costs to investors or capitalists, but that's all it means. It means less costs or more efficiency or more productive only for those who are investing money have much more than they need and live off their money sequencing. So once you get to there, efficiency and productivity is ever lower cost to money sequences, private money sequences, transnational money sequences. 
Well, you can see everything is done in accordance with order. All that I described earlier is also called efficiency and productivity. And it is in accordance with these formulae, which of course are never revealed or never talked about. They're just assumed as given. It's called the prime, you know, it's an, an axiom. And it's the first axiom of so-called economics. So right, efficiency and productivity only mean lower costs and ever lower costs of money sequences. Well, that means lower labor costs. That means labor can starve as long as you can get labor and there's lots of labor out there. And so it starves. That's, that's efficient. That's productive. I'm sorry. These are the laws of efficiency. These are the laws of productivity. It's still going on now as people lose their jobs in the States and millions have lost their job in the States because the self-maximizing money sequences of transnational corporations, for them, it's rational, it's productive, it's efficient, and nothing else is. And so that's what the corporate media always carries as a story. And that's what the president, who's very much positionally determined, carries as a presupposition he must act in accordance with or they'll hound him out. And that's why Trump, again, has been important. He doesn't understand this. He doesn't understand what I've been saying. But what he does see and what he does understand, what nobody else was allowed to say or speak in public, is that much of our public, more and more of our public, our working public, have been dispossessed. They've screwed you. No one was allowed to say this. You could, <laughs> you can look through all the papers and you're not going to find that the system screws the working class of America. But he is saying that, and that's, what, that's the good side of Trump. Right. What he also see, I can go on with that, but I'd like to hear your question <laughs> as we go on. I, I can pick up. Sure, sure. You know, you did mention so-called economics, and in the book you refer to economics as a pseudoscience, and you yep. have a section in the book with the heading um, "Methodological Censorship in the Academy," and I like that area a lot. That that's a good portion. How has the school system been set up to influence our thoughts on economics? How are economics teachings skewed to hide a lot of the points that you've been making? Well, the steps I've taken from rationality through self-maximizing choice to always more money value for the self is good. All these things are presupposed as axiomatic, and that's how we are always governed. And efficiency and productivity is doing this. And moreover, the profit drives the economic engine. There has to be profit or it won't work. All of these things are built in to the inner logic of the system. And so everything that we see that Trump is identifying is uh, is in accordance. And that's where I look for counterexamples. Show me one counterexample. Show me one place, one medium, one party contesting for power, one president, one anybody who doesn't act in this way. They don't know it because it's all, it's an inner logic. It's an unseen logic. Then the states themselves, states and governments themselves, see themselves as effective and, and in need of having legitimacy, and there will only be picked for selection if they serve those transnational money sequences. And that are there again. That's where Trump sees the downstream effect, that the Senate is corrupt, the whole of Washington is corrupt, and so forth. And they're all, you know, just serving themselves. You know, it's not a systematic understanding, but he sees the downstream effect. And that I would say it just plugs in at that level of the set of equations where states serve the dominant private money sequence, and they're called investors. And we must have investment to survive. So the state must serve them, and it now serves them, you know, it used to be basically by wars, but now it's not only wars, the states serve them with handouts, trillions of dollars of handouts, and not just to the banks, but to all the major corporations. I mean, someone like Ralph Nader will point out the downstream effects there, that how the states are basically corporate welfare systems. And so everything else in accordance with this inner logic that you're saying, how did this happen? Well, what I'm doing is describing an inner logic that is not conscious. This interests me perhaps more than anything, is just this inner logic that nobody sees and that is not allowed to be laid bare, is tracking it. And that's what I'm doing here. So everything else becomes a means to this. You know, we've got to do this in order to grow, and we've got to have profit, and we've got to have governments 
helping ensuring that their their corporations are globally competitive. And that means uh, the efficiency and productivity of lowering money, uh, labor costs, et cetera, and not having too many regulations. This is where Trump is uh, completely schizoid because he, one of the things he's attacking now in the latter weeks is uh, regulations, too many regulations, you know, the very thing that Reagan tax and tax cuts. Let's give more tax cuts to the rich. That's where Trump is himself, the cancer agent. But he's, as I say, he's schizoid. He doesn't understand it, nor do, of course, his followers. But that's that's what's happening. At the inner logic is prevailing, even though he sees that the American working class has been screwed and that ordinary people have been dispossessed and that America is in a sorry state without even good bridges when it used to be lead the world or all that. He's all right about all those phenomena. They're undeniable. So nobody else had posed them out inside the corporate media because they'd be silenced. He mm-hmm. couldn't be silenced. And that's his most, you know, that's his greatest achievement is that he hasn't been silenced. He's the only guy I have seen, only person I have seen being able to take on the media, the corporate media, and win in the sense of no matter how they diss him, no matter how they publicly assassinate and slander him, yeah. he just kept on coming and getting stronger <laughs> because he was representing more and more of the dispossessed people. Right. And then everything's obscured there. Oh, no, that's because he's a racist. That's because he's a bigot. That's because he's a psycho. All that stuff, which no doubt is, is uh, true, but it's just di- diverting attention from what's really going on. Exactly. Which he, the disease, which he's seeing the symptoms of. Mm-hmm. And so this means it just overruns everything that we used to know as needs. There isn't, and this is back to the question more directly. This is why economics is a pseudo subject because all it does is describe this as good. Mm-hmm. It never says it never it never goes back to the beginning and say, well, maybe we need a more life coherent sense of rationality, <laughs> and maybe we should consider the cost to life, not just to money bags. Amen. And so it doesn't. It's not even a discipline. Any discipline that's a real discipline is open to counter, you know, another paradigm. Mm-hmm. Is open to when it keeps being refuted. It's open to change and adaptation to the circumstances which have falsified it again and again and again and again. They don't even know what's coming next, and of course they don't because they're just locked into this money sequence system as all axiomatically true and all their laws and so forth follow from it. And so they're life-blind, a priori, life-blind. The so-called discipline is not a discipline. It's a, it's a propaganda of money sequences. That's all it is. And you will notice that's all it covers. It just covers the money transactions between people in the market and uh, assumes this, the state out of there except as a servant, so-called night watchman of the system. So it's, it's a propaganda that it is not, you know, any scientific sort of philosophy of science, but it's more generally known this, that you have to you have to have propositions that are falsifiable. If they're consistent with anything at all, it's a pseudoscience. So called economics has nothing there is nothing that can happen that can disprove its so called science, it's pseudoscience. And that that's the first thing, how you tell that it is a pseudoscience. That's a scientific way of telling it. There's no evidence to account against it. Mm-hmm. And then I would say, as somebody who, who thinks that the real source of value, and this seems self-evident, the real source of value is life and enabling life and the life capacities that, that produce more life capacities through time, through generational time. That, you know, that's, that's the real life capital. And I call it capital because it has the features of real capital. Capital is a concept that's been appropriated, expropriated from the life sequence. Why it seems to make so much sense is because there is something wonderful about a value that produces more value without loss and cumulative gain. That's a beautiful thing. It's hard. It's not really understood in all history before because usually it's understood cyclically. You know, it goes around to the beginning again, and all, and all people basically understand things in terms of natural cycles. But the capital moment, this is wealth that produces more wealth without loss 
and with cumulative gain. You know, that's a dynamic idea. But it leads to cancer as a money sequence system, a transnational money sequence system. But as a life principle and a life axiom, the primary axiom, it leads to better and good by definition. It only leads to better life by definition. That is its wealth, let's say education. It's wealth, you know, the education, they even call it knowledge capital. They just mean knowledge capital as money sequence capital. How the money sequences use knowledge to uh, reduce costs and advantage money sequence investors. That's the only thing they see. And that's a phony understanding of capital. Mm-hmm. But if you understand, and this took, this is a long time coming. I couldn't even, I could not say it in print. For years after I had so seemingly, you know, to my own mind, I had I had discovered this that nobody else was talking about. But it was so hard to shift from one mindset to the other, and I knew the left would be angry at somehow rehabilitating capitalism by talking about life capital. Yeah, and I knew the right and the center would just not want to allow that distinction in because the game's up. If you understand that distinction, the game's up. You can't go any further with that because everybody naturally, not just as a self-maximizing agent of a propaganda system that's enacted every day in every every place, but because people prefer life to money. There's a lot, a lot of literature is written about it. In fact, you might say that anything any good that's ever been done is really talking about that in one way or another. Not, you know, the, about the life, what I call the life code or the life value ontoaxiology. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's not allowed out. And it's not allowed out either by Marxists, which I, you know, I've written one of my first books was on Marx, the structure of Marx's worldview with Princeton Press. And so I've, you know, I've read everything Marx ever wrote, but I came to the conclusion after years and years of puzzling over all this, this well, you've got to go to the life ground. And there isn't a life ground in Marx. I can find one for him, but he doesn't have one. <laughs> he implies it, but he doesn't have it. In fact, that's why Stalinism and everything can go run mad calling itself Marxism. And because the actual theory doesn't ultimately have a life ground. What its ground is, is productive force development or technological development, technological determinism, really. Mm-hmm. And uh, the often technologies can be uh, even publicly owned and still destroy life. And indeed, for Marx, the classes that were, you know, the peasant classes were a necessary cost. You know, their death in the world was a necessary cost of progress. He, in a way, is, you know, the last great bourgeois thinker in the sense that he takes capital to be implicitly God. Mm-hmm. That if the workers can just take over this money capital, then everything will be solved. Well, it isn't <laughs> because life requirements are very different. And what are those life requirements? And then I go down to what they are, and then you get a, you know, you get a whole schedule of needs, not Maslow Mm -hmm. needs or not any other type of needs they're talking about. A need is what life is, life is reduced without. Yeah. That's another formula that you won't find anywhere else, but it, it captures the notion of need and only need. And so, what is it that we cannot do without reduction or death of our life capacities? Well, we've got to have, we've got to have uh, good air to breathe. Right. Got to have clean air to breathe. And indeed, we probably also need some space. And we uh, probably need it as well, some, at least some green space. So we've got to have light. And I call that the atmospheric good. And a need. Well, John, let me ask you this, though. I, I think a lot of the listeners probably see what we should do or know some of the things that we do need. But how do we get there? You know, that's the real issue with the cancer as entrenched as it is. I mean, how do we alter the system's motivations to work for life capital for the greater good rather than individual wealth and greed? It's easy to recognize it or it's easier to recognize it, but it's a lot harder to actually make a real world switch. Well, being a, perhaps because I'm a philosopher, I see the things that, that ultimately decide what's happening are principles, even if they're non-recognized principles. And the key of science, so all science basically, science looks for principles or laws in, in the case of nature. 
then even in the case of social systems, you look for laws, what's governing it, or in my case, I don't want to call it a law between the life sequence of value and the money sequence of value, but I do call those principles and I identify them as regulating principles, whether people are aware of them or not. It's a regulating principle that's at work. For example, when someone says, and for many years they did, Columbus discovered America, the underlying principle is that all human discernment and understanding is European. And they don't know that that's the underlying principle, but it in fact governs them. And it not only governs them, it leads to, it doesn't matter. It's a good thing if we kill all the Indians or all the native population. It's good. So always behind what we see inside a system or inside a person's behavior as an individual inside that system, it's always regulated by principle. And so I can just pose a question back just to get to that first base. Can you think of anything that isn't governed by a principle and indeed isn't governed by the life value principle today versus the money value principle or the money sequence of value versus the life sequence of value? So I'm arguing, and I look for, I love counter examples, uh, arguing that if you want to understand anything that's going on here, you got to understand its regulating principle, or you don't. You don't have a scientific understanding. You don't even have a logical understanding of it. Mm-hmm. And anything that's exceptions to it causes one. You know, if there's an exception to it, then one looks, examines that exception, see if it really is an exception, and then uh, you have to adapt your understanding again, looking for the actually underlying principle that you will be able to predict from, too, that they'll continue to operate with that principle until there's another principle that is instituted. And we've had those principles instituted. For example, slavery, everybody thought it was natural from Aristotle and Plato on. It was a natural state of affairs. And that's that. And that continued up until, you know, hardly uh, a century ago that that, you know, that was no longer a principle we can live with and live in accordance with. And so the principle changed, that uh, slaves were not slaves by nature, but by an institution that uh, needs to be changed. The same with women, who were, in a sense, like slaves, basically the possession of their male master, and uh, with no rights. And we've seen, in our own lifetimes, we've seen big changes happening there. But what we look for, you know, many feminists would say, yeah, you see a big change in the talk, but you don't see any change in what's actually going on in the marketplace because there, women still only have two-thirds of the pay of men. And that's the big, uh, you know, seems to be an anomaly, but according to a principled understanding with principled grounds, you say, well, that's because your economy is not feminist. It doesn't recognize these as issues. Now, they may bring in symbolic women into the hierarchy and even CEO office, but that's not a change in principle. That's basically a propaganda, a symbolic gesture that stops people seeing what's wrong with the principle. Mm -hmm. So look to any problem or indeed any success in our lives. And this was really what, you know, we, we were, we began with in our original conversation about doing this program. Was I, you know, just saying, not only is the war of the world the life value principle or the life sequence of value versus the money principle or the money axiom and the money sequence of value, it is also that war includes everything. Everything is now involved in that war. And isn't that kind of the dirty secret, though, that like these principles that really guide the system... There's different levels to how important they are to the integrity of the system. And they allow us to debate and vote on issues that are kind of minor, but these key ones are kind of off limits to us, it seems. That's right. That's right. So that's the problem of thought. And that's what I try to do is to bring people's understanding to the place where they they see this. Because what I am saying here can be falsified. You can pick out some phenomenon and say, well, you know, they're, they're arguing about this or that, say feminism or racism, which is associated with slavery, and uh, they haven't really changed the principle. Uh, or they have actually changed the principle insofar as it, is, it isn't governing. It's an empirical objective matter here. Mm-hmm. 
And then you say, well, how how can we do it? Because it, it just isn't that. And I hear from your question, we sort of are getting getting this, but look at what's going on. They're still doing these dispossessing so-called trade treaties, trade agreements, which only advantage transnational money sequences and override everything of life value to do so. Even though we know that principle, nothing's changed. They just give out different pretenses, you know, and basically have a brand change. Oh, people are sick of that, so we'll change from the Bush cancer system leader. They don't think of that. But we'll change, we'll not change the cancer. We'll change the front man. Right. So we have a brand change with Obama. Mm-hmm. And that's all. And everybody says, oh, things are going to be better now. The president of Hope, Nobel Peace Prize, everybody applauds, thanks to the principles change. And what I'm saying, no, no. The regulating principle hasn't changed at all. You've just been duped again by a brand change. And the people inside that position, until they understand these things, are not going to be able to do anything because it now is master. But it's not master in my life, and it's not master in your life. And here we come to the individual level, which I, you know, I think the individuals unhappily are determined by their positions within a system that has violence and force and lies behind it. That's always true of this system, since it's a cancer-like system. That is especially true. Well, what about a sense of individuals? I don't do an act in my life, including right now. I'm going to take a sip of my water. Oh, that's nice. (laughs) (laughs) And I won't drink any water that's in a plastic bottle. And I will never accept water. I've almost died from it when I was traveling through India, choosing water that was in a well, but it was polluted without my knowing it, without even the villagers knowing it. It almost Mm. took me down with a maybe dysentery overnight almost. It's incredible. And I'm going to only patronize the provision of water that is a good provision that makes it universally accessible. So I'm only going to use public water or demand public water or filter it in some way myself until we get that change involved. Now, that's just water. But go go through every part of your life here. You know, this technical marvel that we have that we can now talk over a phone and communicate to each other about what ultimately matters, which was never possible before. Mm-hmm. And uh, But you got to watch it because that same system is into basically commercial control. You know, it's basically into the secret of all propaganda, as nicely said by Bernays, who was a nephew of Freud. He said it's a, you know, it's a, a mechanism of consent that rules and regiments people without their knowledge of it. Mm-hmm. And this is the invisible government. He said that back in 1926, and he's the founder of public relations. <laughs> so the public relations of the knowledge economy, the information economy, and nothing but saturating ads, 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 ads everywhere for always, always for transnational money sequences mm-hmm. or trying to be transnational money sequences. Always. So. I can change my life by what media I, my, my, my own life will change radically if I don't, for example, watch commercial television. And I, I could say that since television came in, but half my life has been without, without it. And, uh, or it's public, you know, where the public sector gets into the television and it's more reliable. So that changes my pastime too and my, computer, which I live from basically as a writer, always made, made tremendous advantages for me. And I always ask the life question, does it enable life more? Is it life coherent? Does it more inclusively and life coherently enable my life and other life? That's what the coherence is. It's not only that it enables your life, but it's coherent with others' needs, so it enables their lives too. Every Mm -hmm. commitment for every act that anyone ever does can be a life value commitment. And in fact, we see people doing this all the time. Food is the best example, really, of where you see a huge change in awareness coming. Ten years ago, they really, the junk food, well, you know, the U.S. had made sure. They just said they would discontinue funding the World Health Organization if they came out with anything about food and junk food or even even a, a good diet, which you have to have for a nourishing diet. 
Mm-hmm. They would stop. They'd just defund it. And that's the principal weapon is defunding, if not right. war. If not kill, defund first, then kill. Mm-hmm. And so every moment of our lives is such a choice between, in our time, the money sequence of value and the life sequence of value. Right on. I do like a lot of what you're saying. People should live more principled lives. But there is an issue here that we have to address because I've had several guests who talk about classic capitalism as the mechanism for lifting hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people out of poverty in the last century. That the technological innovations and advancements of our time have capitalism to thank as their catalyst. And they say that our weapons shouldn't be aimed at capitalism, but rather centralization. How would you respond to someone with that mindset or even anarchists or free market libertarians who argue the state is the real villain of the story here? Well, you've just encapsulated very, as you're doing throughout here, you've encapsulated the two main arguments. The first argument I would call uh, it is Marxist in origin, but also that needn't be Marxist. That capitalism is the solution. Marx believed that, you know, that we had to, that we had to have capitalism reach its zenith of where it was no longer productive, and then only when it was no longer productive, when it was choosing between productive regression and productive advance, the system would always, he thought it was an historical law, choose the way you just described, that that, that capitalism will always, you know, all these, for example, a life expectancy will change and, and improvement. And, you know, for example, electric lighting, it was through capitalism or through knowledge capital and the internet and so forth. And each one of these, I would go through and say, well, uh, include, you know, whether it's by a Marxist or by a orthodox economics, because they really do share that same argument, both of them. And that's why the one is not really a revolutionary argument in the sense of changing the system. It's basically how the system can still work if the workers are the ruling class. And that doesn't get into the problems that have been built in principle. So in those cases, I would say, well, you know, to take the people die less, especially childbirth would be the most dramatic success, mm-hmm. or life expectancy. And that wasn't capitalism. That was in spite of capitalism. Right from the get-go, it was about having clean supplies of water right from the get-go and separating water from sewage. That was the secret to it, and that happened, you know, that was not capitalist. It were the women in England, for example, that during the cholera epidemic said we got to have, they understood, women are usually leading these things, by the way. It's not capitalism at all. It's probably the women. And they led the force and ended up with public sewage and so forth, which then was copied everywhere because it made the difference between life and death for most of your population. Yeah, more than half of Europe was killed by not having this, not having a separation of water and sewage. Mm-hmm. You know, because of the bubonic plague, which was carried by rats, which we had a you know parasite on them, that et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the only way you're going to fix it was if you separated. <laughs> The water, which mothers would know. The women would know because they're dealing with water all the time. And so it wasn't capitalism at all. And now you think, oh, well, but look at this capitalism that gave us the Internet. No, 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 no. As you know, you you probably know more than I do about this. It's all been shareware from the beginning. It's all been a science to begin with when I was first introduced to it before it became fashionable and I resisted it because (laughs) I was used to the other way. But my physicist friends, because I was very much involved in, in then Science for Peace, which has, by the way, been usurped by uh, basically U.S. propaganda. But in the old days, Science for Peace, they were at the front end. They had Nobel Prize members in there a lot. They were at the front end of the Internet because that's what they were doing in their physics experiments and discussions with each other without having to go travel thousands of miles or, uh, you know, unaffordable telephone expenses that only happen once in a day. Or, you know, the Internet was introduced by public scientists. And the people who have <laughs> all, the, all the innovations, like, I mean, what the shareware's in one way or another behind all of it. And then it's the non-capitalist discourses and communications of facts in spite of capitalism is all the real information and knowledge that you can get from the web now. By avoiding capitalism, by stepping around it, which now these tools allow us. 
So I would say now, you know, I'm open to, of course, dispute here if anybody can think of a, a thing that capitalism gave us that wasn't in fact started beforehand by non-capitalism or in spite of capitalism. Mm-hmm. Right. And I struggle with that, too, because I have guests on both sides of the question. And so many talk about, oh, well, if we just had a free market yeah. that didn't have all this influence from the elites, yeah. it would be a, a more freer society. But I'm just not sure, because I think that with capitalism, you're always going to have incentives for criminal action to get more profit. <laughs> of course, you're right. This is the libertarian ideology on one half of it. You know, there's capitalist libertarianism and there's socialist libertarianism or local libertarianism where it's by the community determination, self-determination. And anarchism is another expression of it. So even in Marx's day, there were anarchists that argued this way, but it's become much more, especially through the um, uh, U.S., not, not, not many people elsewhere believe any of that liber capitalist libertarianism. That's basically what I would call an American religion, <laughs> which isn't recognized as a religion, thinks it's very rational, but it it's not life coherent. It's, you know, just leads to... As you said, not just crime, but it just leads to, if you leave that alone, try to think of one social advance that's made without public authority, without public taxes, without uh, even, you know, from police to water supply. Again, it's the same thing. Now, why don't they know that? Because they're a religion. They're a dogma. And I, you know, they've got, they stretch in, uh, and it's carried by Americans. I don't, I've not met anybody who's a capitalist, anarchist, libertarian outside of the states or from the states yeah. or born and bred in the states. It's more, well, it's got, it's penetrated Canada quite a bit, but not, not to the point where people take it seriously. <laughs> but it does, it has penetrated, but not elsewhere. And why? Well, this is a, you know, usually there are religious substitutes for the the lost religions we have. And the, although libertarianism pretends to, and in many matters uh, other than economic, it is rational, here it's religious. There's only one God, there shall be no other God before it, and that is capitalism. That is free investment with no interference. That is, ultimately, the transnational money sequence cancer system. Mm -hmm. But they can't go any of those steps. And I've, I've, I've been glad to, you know, I, I tried to debate a very well-known libertarian up here, an American, of course, but he, uh, you know, as many carpetbaggers came up here and took over Canadian universities, and they just can't deal with it. They just cannot deal with it. They'll just change the topic because they're good solids, you know, they're good at sophistry. Right. But that's what I think about it. And I just say, well, just take a look at it. You think it'll all be better without the state by free investment? Then you can go into the cancer argument or you can go into the argument of which particular advance do you think, do you, are you sure has been by this money sequence, private money sequence method? Right. And whenever they're put that one they have to face, they change the topic or try to find, you know, something to be sophistical about. Right. Well, I mean, it's the privatization of the medical system, of the prison system oh. that creates a lot of America's yeah. problems. But I guess to me, maybe yeah. it's not an either or. Maybe it's a little bit of both. Well, it depends what you mean by privatization. If you mean by privatization for profit, right. money profit, ever more money profit, life blind money profit. No, it always fails. And you try to think of any privatization that's actually run by corporations, it always fails. They never admit to failures. But I again in debate say, well tell me one place that you think has been a success with this. There isn't any. Right. But if you mean by private, like a friend of uh, my brother's who's a very uh, well-known surgeon and agent in public health in Canada, has been a minister, associate minister of public health. He has a good friend who's unfortunately since passed away. Maybe he was poisoned. That just occurs to me. Huh. He had a private system of surgery that was incredibly more efficient in wait times and in good results, that is healthy results than any other method. And he could not get it in. It still isn't in. And the demonstration was clear. 
the public sector did not want to talk to him because it showed them up or that they were already, as has increasingly happened, they were already bought by the corporations hmm. who had done them favors and so forth, which they do on the inside lobbying. There's, <laughs> there's inside lobbying going on all the time, nonstop, to privatize, privatize, privatize. And they're very aggressive. And they're always in suits, and they always have deep voices, and they always are very certain about what they know. <laughs> but they're just propaganda. Right. And it works. Because if it doesn't work, then we won't fund that guy. In fact, it's time the newspapers expose this inflexibility. Yeah, I'm with you. Man, we, we definitely have talked about a lot, but I think uh, probably one of the most important things for people to take away is that there is a huge divide and conquer program in play. And if we can get over things like black and white, get over things like libertarian and socialist, and instead unite around that uh, priority of getting a better set of principles to guide our system, maybe with that we can do something because we do have the numbers. And we've got the life ground too. And the life ground is all, you know, the simple is all the conditions required to take your next breath is the life ground. And there are a lot of conditions and they've got to be, uh, they've got to be in our consciousness as something to enable, not destroy and to enable through time. And the life capital is the formula for that. And, uh, we've got, we're grounded. You see, we're not, we're not, we haven't been life grounded before. No theory has been life grounded before. And it's really just taking Taking things to down to where it's self-evident that that's what we're for, and all questions and problems really need that, you know, that to be the the lens through which you understand it. Amen. Wow. Well, John, this has been a real treat for this college dropout to spend some time with right. such an accomplished <laughs> academic as yourself. <laughs> Well, you know, the reason we're doing it is because you showed yourself to be very informed. And we're thinking in, in principal terms. I try. And not many people do that. So it's been a pleasure for me too, Greg. Well, thanks for taking me up on the offer. Would you like to remind the people where they can follow up on your work or tell us about anything else you're working on in the future before we go? Well, you can capture a lot of my book, which uh, is was published in 2013, The Cancer Stage of Capitalism, From Crisis to Cure, and that's an encyclopedic book. And then as for articles and monographs uh, that I've done since, I've done them all over the place, but the place that carries all of them and archives all of them pretty well, except the one on 9-11. It only has part of it. I, it used to anyway. But it has all my work I've done as in monographs and articles that is really for a, a wider audience is on global research. So if you just if you just dial in on your computer, Google global research, you'll come up with all all of their work. And, um, and my work is really the philosophical underpinnings of it, whatever I address, what is essentially current event problems. And they have archives of my work that uh, run to, you know, it's, I, I don't even know how many there are in there, but there's more than a book worth because they wanted to turn it into a book. Mm -hmm. But I said, well, you've got it on archives. You can have it. And then also on uh, PRN, Public Radio Network, also you can Google it and find it. You'll find on archives a lot of conversations like the ones we, the one we had today. And you got you got lots of uh, lots of me there. <laughs> Although awesome. today I talked about things that have not been heard before. Awesome, a That's lot of it. Great to hear. Yeah. All right, John. Well, keep fighting the good fight and take care out there. All right. Yeah. You you as well, Greg, and your listeners. Bye for now. Will do. All right, all right. Big John McMurtry, give it up for him. I do apologize for his phone quality. Definitely one of the rougher ones in a while. Big thanks to those who helped make it better. I do have a few people who have contacted me over the years about audio quality. And when I get one of these rougher interviews, I run it past them, see if they can do a better job on it than I can. And that's usually the case. So I did have some help and it was appreciated. It'd be nice if it was a little more clear, but this was the only way to get them. And I'm a big fan of John's book and the speeches he's given on Zeitgeist Day events. I felt like it was a unique message worth getting despite all that. Plus, I think the libertarian, let the free market free kind of view is very ingrained in this alternative world. And 
I wanted to go the other way for a change. Everybody knows that's not my favorite paradigm. But man, I know shows have been slow to come out this month too. The reason for that is that I recorded several at the beginning of the month because I knew I needed some time to finish Higher Side Clothing, which is officially done now. Anyone who's connected with me on social media will see that, but if you haven't, just go to thehiresideclothing.com and we got 12 all new full color designs, amazing artwork, all relating directly to THC episodes. It's pretty sick. I'm very proud of that. And thanks to my special lady who helped too, but it did take us some time. So I recorded at the beginning of the month, got Higher Side Clothing launched, and then had some Thanksgiving obligations, and now I'm working through the shows I have to get them out before the end of the month. Like I said in the beginning, this episode was recorded the day before the election, so we didn't really know what was going to happen, but I thought John made it pretty clear that he saw some positives in a Trump win. And I'd just been saying how shocked I am that the Clinton network was not only defeated like that, but exposed in a big way with Pizzagate and the Podesta email leak. These are interesting times, but let me tell you about these next two shows because they tie into this pretty heavily. So I talked to John the day before the election, and then I recorded an interview with Daniel Pinchbeck on the day after. And it's a weird episode. It's a weird show because my energy and Daniel's were in very different places that morning. And we have a fair amount of disagreements as the interview goes on. I mean, you'll see. And then the next show after that is with the legendary author of the Secret Sun blog, Chris Knowles. And that's pretty great, too, because we have a lot of the same thoughts about what's going on in the power networks. That's going to be a good one in that THC sweet spot that I think a lot of people love to hang out in. And then we can close the books on November. And we'll be getting to a Meme Magic and Keck show soon, a full-on Pizzagate show soon with David Seaman, who is really digging deep and playing with fire, looking into this exposed pedophilia network. I mean, his last tweet was, if I die, it is not a suicide. So we need to talk to him quick, and hopefully he stays safe in the next five days. So things are happening, people. They are happening. I'm sorry for the delay releasing shows, but I have no more t-shirt companies to launch going forward, so we should be better paced. I say that all the time, but I do love you guys. Thanks for listening. I hope John's points about the underlying value mechanisms were of interest to you, and hopefully we can get down to the root and change some of our incentives around to be more respectful of life capital. Sign up for Plus if you'd like to hear us go deeper into that conversation and get into John's thoughts on 9-11, as well as other good stuff. You know the drill. Either way, I've done what I can, and I wish you the best. Your move, market manipulators, education indoctrinators, and structural sorcerers of the Rockefeller Rothschild machine, your fucking move. They built a little empire out of some crazy garbage called the blood of the exploited working class. But they've overcome their shyness. Now we're calling them your highness. And the world screams, save me, THC. They destroyed the bonds of friendship and respect. Between the only people left who'd even look them in the eye. Now they laugh and make a fortune off the same ones that they tortured. And a world screams, save me, THC. Let's look for Jesus. Some will say. Crazy.
garbage called the blood of the explorer.